Georges Méliès was a visionary, an illusionist. He is known for making over 500 films in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, many of which are full of monsters, dismemberment, fantasy, and strange surreal visions. The French director is credited with what's thought to be the first horror film, House of the Devil, in 1896. When it comes to film, it's a bit easier to trace the line of origin. However, these were so-called silent films. We know there's no recording of scores from this era, so where do horror film scores originate? Let's explore together and go as far back as we can. Halloween is my absolute favorite holiday, so I felt I needed to honor the spirit of the season with a special video related to horror. This one goes more in depth than I even planned on, but not nearly as in depth as I realized I could have gone. But nonetheless, strap in, grab yourself a snack, get cozy, maybe even grab a pumpkin spice latte. Also, leave your favorite scary piece, horror score, or even your favorite horror movie down below. But before I begin, please give me grace when it comes to the pronunciation of non-English words and names. I will do my best. Though the era prior to the 1930s is known as the era of silent films, it's actually a title that's a little misleading. Yes, the films themselves are silent because of the lack of technology at the time. However, it's known that music was often played live in the theater when silent films were showing. Unfortunately, we don't have a record of exactly what music was playing at these shows, but we can get a pretty good idea based on the films of the 1930s and 40s. The earliest sound-inclusive horror films utilized classical pieces that already existed. The Phantom of the Opera originally premiered in 1925 as a silent film. It was re-released in 1930 with sound and did have an original score composed by Joseph Carl Brill but the operatic scenes relied heavily on pieces from Tchaikovsky and Chopin. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1941 famously included Johann Sebastian Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor in the opening credits. Let's go back even further, though and take a look at some of the pieces that have inspired the more modern horror film scores. Interestingly enough, not much is known about Toccata and Fugue in D minor. It's not even confirmed whether or not Bach wrote it, though it is widely credited to him. The first known publication of this work is from 1833, and through the efforts of Felix Mendelssohn and a friend, there was a Bach revival in the 1830s and 1840s. This piece in particular picked up traction in the 1870s, but honestly, it wasn't until it was featured in Jekyll and Hyde that it was associated with horror. And since that is the case with Toccata and Fugue, there is a different era that I would like to focus on today. The Romantic period, highly influential on modern film scores in general, is known for its supernatural and imaginative themes, emotional pieces, and non-conventional instrumentation. It's within this period that we begin to see the conscious choice to make music that is intended to feel frightening or unsettling. Hector Berlioz was a French composer whose reputation was controversial. Many thought him to be a genius, while others looked down on him for his lack of form and conventionality. His wife, Harriet Smithson, who he was quite obsessed with upon meeting, inspired one of his most well-known pieces of music, Symphony Fantastic, written when Berlioz was only 27 years old. The main character in Berlioz's story is a man who poisoned himself with opium to escape the depths of despair after being rejected by his one true love, which leads to a series of hallucinations. This symphony has five movements, but in this case, I'm specifically referring to the fifth movement, titled Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. Berlioz describes the scene in the program notes, translated here. He sees himself at a witch's Sabbath, in the midst of a hideous gathering of shades, sorcerers and monsters of every kind who have come together for his funeral. Strange sounds, 
groans, outbursts of laughter, distant shouts which seem to be answered by more shouts. The beloved melody appears once more, but has now lost its noble and shy character, it is now no more than a vulgar dance tune, trivial and grotesque, it is she who is coming to the Sabbath, roar of delight at her arrival, she joins the diabolical orgy, the funeral knell tolls, burlesque parody of the Dizere, the dance of the witches. The dance of the witches combined with the Dizere. This piece demonstrates the forward-thinking ways of Berlioz, while he reinvents the way the instruments are played to create sound effects to help his audience imagine the frightening scenario. Cackling and dancing witches, howling winds, funeral bells, rattling bones, and the now familiar, high-pitched, dissonant string sounds that make our hairs stand on end. It's clear that the 20th century and even 21st century compositions were inspired by the bone-chilling effects used in Dream of a Witch's Sabbath, but more on that soon enough. Matas Mussorgsky was the more daring of his contemporaries. He refused an education from a conservatory and only learned his skills from his highly educated friends, namely Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov. Mussorgsky was rebellious, but also troubled. He dealt with alcoholism and died at 42 years old, at which point most of his works were unfinished or unpublished. One of which, written when he was in his 20s, was called Night on Bald Mountain, completed in 1867. After his death, Rimsky-Korsakov took Mussorgsky's piece and revised and published it. Apparently, the original version was even more demonic and dissonant, which was toned down in the revision. Today, this piece is most famous for its appearance in the Disney film Fantasia from 1940. Night on Bald Mountain, also known as Night on Bear Mountain, is energetic, dark, brooding, and in a time where religion is extremely important, radically sinister. It's written as a symphonic poem, or a tone poem, which intends for the music to paint a visual image or story, which for this piece is laid out as follows. One, an underground noise of inhuman voices, appearance of the spirits of darkness followed by an appearance of Satan, and, two, his adoration. Three, a black mass. Four, joyful dancing of the witch's Sabbath. With the tolling of a church bell, the darkness is finally dispersed. Similar to Berlioz, Mussorgsky was imagining a witch's Sabbath on St. John's Eve, which is June 23rd, on a rugged mountaintop in stormy weather. It's packed with booming percussion, dissonant horns, and slithering descending lines that have left a lasting, spine-chilling impression. The last piece I want to talk about for this portion is called The Monster Mash. Written by Boris Pickett as a novelty piece in 1962, it was released just days before Halloween. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I hate that song so much. Danse macabre, a French term which translates to dance of death, is one that comes from European tradition of the Middle Ages. Danse macabre refers to the personification of death, and was intended to be memento mori, or a reminder of the fragility of life. According to legend, one night a year, the dance of death occurs at midnight, where the reaper himself calls the dead from their graves to dance to his fiddle until dawn. Upon daybreak, the dead would return to their graves only to return the same night one year later. Throughout the years, dating all the way back to 1424 actually, Many have created visual arts depicting the dance macabre, including the Disney cartoon from 1929 that you may or may not recognize. Spooky, scary skeletons. One composer decided to create his own image of the dance macabre, but using music to do so, alongside a poem written by Henri Casalis. French composer and organist Camille Saint-Saëns was a child prodigy who made his debut at the age of 10. 
He would come to be known internationally amongst his contemporaries, Franz Liszt, Robert and Clara Schumann, and Richard Wagner. And one of his famous, or rather infamous, pieces was Dance Macabre. Like Bald Mountain, this was written as a tone poem and essentially painted a chilling image through composition and instrumentation. Critically, this was not well received upon release, and given the time period, caused a lot of unrest for audience members as the French superstition came to life. Little did they know, that's what we want out of great horror. The piece begins with a harp ringing twelve times to represent the stroke of midnight. Then immediately death enters, demonstrated by the diminished string sounds we've become very familiar with since. As the title suggests, Dance Macabre is very much a waltz, swaying back and forth even with the contrast of the dark harmonic structures. This piece is only 7 minutes and 9 seconds, but you feel the emotional push and pull for the entirety, the feeling of safe, and then unsafe, and then safe again. The violin sits as the protagonist, presumably the reaper in the story, while the background characters are played by the xylophone, horns, and woodwinds. You can follow along with the melody to really get a grasp of what's going on, up until the very end where we're left to ponder this very melancholy melody. Topped with mysterious and distant pizzicato chords. While its initial reception was negative, after a Franz Liszt piano arrangement and a few decades of growing on people, the Danse Macabre became a beloved classic still used in modern media today. I know I really only touched on three romantic pieces, but I think we have enough here to really begin to compare them to the thrills of the 20th century and beyond. Let's take a quick look at some of the most beloved horror film scores from the years past and present that compare to the aforementioned pieces. You really didn't think I wasn't going to bring up Psycho, did you? While the score from this 1960 Alfred Hitchcock film has been incredibly influential on the scores to follow it, it is inarguably inspired by the Romantic era. The theme, composed by Bernard Herrmann, feels incredibly similar to Dance Macabre in the way that it pushes and pulls emotionally, with the violins playing a legato motif every now and then, to make those stabbing chords really pop. Right around two minutes, a lighter section is introduced, and we return to that idea of feeling unsafe, and then safe, and so on. It goes on for about a minute, just when you start to feel okay, and then we're back to the tension. The famous shower scene score is cued right around four minutes and 30 seconds, and this part, to me anyway, is very much in line with the Berlioz piece in the way that the violins sound like screaming or distressed sounds from something living. Speaking of Berlioz, the theme from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is quite literally the Dies Irae, composed by Berlioz for Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. but the rest of the score also features some of the characteristics we've discussed. The theme from the 1976 film The Omen, composed by Jerry Goldsmith, also falls into this category with its romantic-esque composition, full of strings and timpani, but what makes this one really impactful is the Baroque-style choral piece placed on top. Absolutely fantastic. The theme from Jaws, composed by John Williams, feels very similar to Night on Bald Mountain, with its roaring timpani, crashing cymbals, gorgeous horn sounds, and swirling violins. Of course, we again have those stabbing string sounds that never fail. Those of which can also be heard in the original Friday the 13th score by Harry Manfredini. The Silence of the Lambs theme, composed by Howard Shore, also has sprinklings of the classic strings, 
but seemingly placed strategically as it came out in 1991. The Ring from 2002 had a soundtrack composed by Hans Zimmer that involves a lot of these same techniques and effects. Some of the more modern scores that pull from romantic ideas include the theme from Insidious, composed by Joseph Bashara, which is heavily reminiscent of these pieces and may be the most modernized version of what I'm researching today. Us by Michael Abels, and Midsummer, composed by the Hoxton Cloak. And just for fun, I'm just going to rattle off some honorable mentions that don't necessarily compare to romantic pieces. The Exorcist, which was not actually written for the film, but rather selected for the film. Halloween, which is written in 5-4 and makes the piece all the more unstable. A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is so wonderfully 80s. Rosemary's Baby, an incredibly creepy lullaby paired with clashing, slightly pitched strings. The Thing, which creatively plays on the sound of a heartbeat with bass paired with Baroque-style organ, and Candyman, a very Baroque-style arrangement composed by Philip Glass. But also, Scream, It Follows, Hereditary, The Babadook. Uh, I just really, really love horror movies, and I could go on forever. But also, why do I like to feel scared? I know this topic has been covered by a variety of content creators, but... I think it's only fair that before we wrap this up, we discuss what it is exactly that makes something scary. According to the scientists at USC, humans enjoy the sensation of fear within a safe environment, or, say, uh, a horror movie. The experience of reacting to a jump scare, only to realize moments later that you are indeed safe, can release a series of hormones like endorphins or dopamine. By this logic, the goal for a film composer is to play with emotions this way, within the music. But how do they do that? Number one is dissonance. Dissonance refers to two or more notes that do not agree with each other, or notes that clash. The reason for this being one of two things. First, is that their frequency wavelengths are incompatible. This is typically with notes that are close together, like a minor or major second. The other is that the ear is looking for a note to resolve, and it doesn't resolve. An example of this is a root note played with a minor or major seventh interval. To the human ear, in Western culture anyway, these combinations feel tense and thus make our bodies react viscerally. It's widely believed that the tritone, or three whole tones apart, were considered a devil's interval by early music composers of the Middle Ages. I too believed this for a really long time, actually. However, it's not true. Adam Neely explains why here, up in the eye, and I recommend watching. Though this is not true, It is still widely thought to be unsettling for listeners when the interval does not properly resolve. Number two, high frequencies. Commonly thought to originate in the film Psycho we talked about earlier, shrill, high-pitched frequencies can make us feel uncomfortable. It's speculated that the reason for this is because a lot of the music we consume doesn't feature vocals or instruments that sit that high for an extended period of time. Much of modern music sits right around the octaves where human-speaking voices typically sit. Psychologists have also speculated that there is an evolutionary aspect to this, since most animals make high-pitched sounds when in pain or distress. Number three, playing with silence. Another huge scare factor within music is the strategic placement of silence, or in musical terms, extreme contrast in dynamics. When music is played and then stops, we feel a moment of uncertainty or perhaps relief. But when those shrill, high-pitched frequencies come in abruptly, it causes stress, shock, and sometimes even a physical reaction. 
This is sometimes called nonlinear music. Films like Insidious utilize music that is intentionally very scarce and sometimes extra quiet. This leaves us feeling on edge, sort of constantly waiting for the jump scare that may or may not come. I think it goes without saying that movies in general wouldn't be the same without the scores that give them life, and I personally feel that that is especially true for horror films. And while there are plenty of scores that I didn't mention here, it's undeniable that some of the most iconic ones wouldn't exist in the way that they did without the influence of Berlioz, Mazorsky, and saint Sans. I really, really hope that you all enjoyed this video because as much as I love horror, watching all of those clips back to back and listening to all those scores gave me nightmares for a week. If you made it this far in the video, leave a little pumpkin emoji in the comments and happy Halloween. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more history and analysis content. I try to put out videos at least once a month, but with more support, I could definitely dedicate even more time. So be sure to join our community and engage and help us to grow into something great. I always, always appreciate kind thoughts and questions, and you all have so many fantastic ideas, so keep them coming. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to the next one.